And you said that our, our stories are a little different. So what was the difference between what you thought you were going to read and what did you finish the book by any chance? Uh, I don't want you to ruin it, but I'm, I have like 30 pages to go. Okay. Okay. Um, and there are some spots that I'm like, wow. Okay. But no, that's okay. You can, you can, you can say whatever I, you I finally got the title when I got to that portion. Okay. That's the, title. I'm like, did they call him Steven and Michael and Kevin? What the hell is going on here? And I, I, you know, I was totally confused, but, and I won't even attempt the last name. Uh, watch a kusha cows wag us back wag us back okay okay but um well i mean my my mom was was born into privilege i can put that into no excuses i mean she was a you know her uh my grandfather and her mother you know had some means he owned some car dealerships and and all these things and like a lot of kids did in the 70s which is what she was a teenager in the 70s she did a lot of stupid crap i mean that's just what it was and she became addicted to heroin um I, I i met my father for the first time in las vegas um he knocked on my door me and dan were already together so i mean we've been together 21 years but that should tell you so i was 23 24 and he found out me and dan were in las vegas and he knocked on the door at 9 a.m and i opened the door and here's this six foot five 350 pound gigantic man and he was holding two crown royals at like 8 30 in the morning and said are you my name's william chad he said are you, are you are you william i'm like yes he said i'm your father literally that's and i never saw him again we went out and hung out you know and i'm like okay well um but anyway my, i ended up having and this is not no joke i don't believe it until me and my two 100% biological sisters get together. They don't believe it until we're all together and we're telling stories and then they're like, so that shit wasn't BS. I mean, that you were, pardon my French, but you were telling the truth. So, but uh, by the time I was old enough to be in fourth grade, um, I didn't walk into a school until fourth grade. Um, not once, never, you know, never been in one. <laughs> so, but by the time I was old enough to, to be in a school in fourth grade, I had lived with what I called 17 different stepfathers. And that's that I can remember because my mother was a heroin addict. And then she, I mean, uh, one of the greatest guys uh, was a guy named Johnny Johnson. Um, you can't make that name up. And he was her counselor at a heroin clinic. And she was dealing drugs to his, to the other patients. And he, she ended up, you know, con, you know, me and my mother have a, a fevered relationship at this point. I kind of take care of her, but her brain is fried. I mean, you can only do, you know, that kind of stuff for that long. And, you know, she has absolutely no memory. Um, um, but anyway, uh, all, all these horrible things that, that did happen to me, a lot that, that, that do kind of fall in line with that happened to you, but I just kind of blocked them out and, you know, just it made me very self-sufficient and very, I don't need you for anything. I don't need anybody for anything. I can do it all, you know. And the last guy, number 17, was a guy named Sam. And he had a gold lightning bolt, bolt um, front tooth, i.e. he was black. That's where my grandfather, who ha had a lot of means, drew the line. He didn't care what the hell was happening with all that, that we were in. He didn't, didn't give a crap about us, me or my two sisters, at that my, until she got into a relationship with a black guy. That should tell you his character. Um, you know, um, but, and I mean, within uh, probably three weeks, we had the Texas Rangers crawling out through our yard, seizing us, you know, from my mother and she's not going to fight it you know she didn't have the money she was a junkie she didn't care that kind of thing but uh because i watched my mother shoot up and do all those things i've always been very just i didn't want anything to do with drugs so much so that i mean you know to get me to take blood thinner the doctors had to beg me you know now i understand that there are there are, there are drugs for a particular reason i i now i actually i, I was the, like the, the one of the first 100 or 150 people in Florida to get a medical marijuana card because it, it instantly gets rid of phantom pain. And I mean, instantly. Um, and I don't know if you know much about phantom pain, but 
it's where you feel your leg burning when you don't have a leg, you know, or it's itching or, and it will, uh, I have many friends that have committed suicide over it, uh, but it will literally get rid of phantom pain. Now I can eat a quarter of one brownie and not have phantom pain for six to eight months. It's just gone, which is just a, mir a miracle of, uh, uh, from on high, if you ask me. You mentioned something and it was, it's significant for me this week, as you, as you know, um, you mentioned that you've had friends and people you've known um, due to the tragedy that they've, uh, they've had to grapple with and the pain or the phantom pain and the struggles uh, that have committed suicide. And there is nothing I can say to you other than I'm so glad you're here. So whatever you got to do to stay here is what I want you to do. And same with me. I mean, I have grappled with suicidal thoughts. And I had about 10 years ago when my dad was uh, sick and then died, uh, I thought I was doing okay with it. Um, and again, this is just a little riff off of what you're saying, but you talk about phantom pain, you know, a year later, uh, you know, that grief, that pain of losing my father, again, that wasn't a physical sure. part of my body, but it was similar uh, in that um, was profound. And there was nothing, nothing that was gonna take that grief away. And so I can understand when you talk about your friends and the sadness that comes with that. And I think you know that this past week I did lose someone to suicide and it's been a very hard week. There's also been that sense of this was not simply about a physical or emotional, quote unquote, emotional uh, turmoil. This was a mental health issue that uh, was partially physical but then exacerbated by the mental health ramifications of the physical. So I wanted to ask you, there's obviously with uh, an amputee, there's obviously with anyone who has physical injuries, this person who passed away, who uh, committed suicide, um, had uh, mental health issues, uh, mm -hmm. but also had had a brain tumor. So they had had what I would say would be the equivalent of traumatic brain injury from the uh, tumor, which was not, which was benign, but needed to be removed sure. and was never the same again. And I think that similar to your friends, uh, the people you've known, but similar to you and that, uh, you're never the same again. Well, I'll and, tell you, um, I, I tweet everything. Uh, it's my diary. I don't even tweet half the crap I tweet for other people minus, you know, messing with you or messing with the, but you know, of the, however many followers I have, I know about a hundred of them. I mean, that I try to maintain a relationship with, you know, it's, I don't believe in the whole follow back, just, you know, I just don't believe in, in that. But, um, but so I treat it as my diary so I can scroll back and go, this is what happened on this day. And this is what happened on this day. And uh, so I was in Budapest um, last December um, and uh, um, you know, we were starting to hear, you know, some uh, scuttlebutt about this COVID thing, you know, not last December, the December before last, so of 2019, um, right when it was tearing up Wuhan. Uh, so we were in Budapest and then we, we had a week in Cyprus. And then we, you know, and me and Dan were horribly sick. Well, now nobody, knew, nobody knew what it was. There was no like, you know, don't get on a plane if you have it. But we're both pretty much convinced we had it at that point because it was just a strange, weird sickness. Or we could just be, you know, um, completely blowing it out of proportion. But at any rate, I, 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 I flew back and um, um, at the airport in, in you know, uh, Orlando MCO airport, I through an inguinal hernia uh, on my right side. Um, so I, I went to the surgeon, he looked at it. He said, yeah, you definitely have a hernia. We have to go in and fix it. And I've tweeted about this and I've also tweeted about what you may not have read, but um, um, they sent me for cardiac clearance and all these things and, you know. Um, so the, the day comes for him to fix the hernia. He fixes the hernia. Uh, the assistant physicians in there with him before I even move out of pre-op or post-op, you know, when you're, you know, they're bringing you out of it and you're, I don't know if you've had surgeries, but you know, you're, you're back in that same room and you're kind of still drugged, but you, the doctor's talking to you for one last time. And I literally tell him and 
you know, Dr. Smith, his assistant, where you cut me over here feels fine. I've had so many surgeries. I mean, I just know. I mean, I, I've literally had so many of them that are like, um, it, it's just almost routine for me at this point. I said, but my right testicle is killing me. Uh, and he said, that's just normal. And I said, are you sure? And he said, that's normal. I said, okay. So, um, you know, they, you know, I went up to my room and uh, uh, I think they discharged me in like three days as soon as they got my blood levels stabilized because I'm on massive blood thinner. And uh, uh, the one week follow up at the doc, the surgeon's office, I said, doc, I don't care what you're saying. This is fine. Whatever you did with the hernia is fine, but you did something to my testicle and it is on fire. And he said, well, I'll just give you some more pain meds. And I said, doc, I have every known pain med you could possibly think of on shelves at my house. If you want it, I got it. Because, uh, I, you know, you go through so many surgeries, and I mean, I have fentanyl patches. You know, I mean, I don't use them, but, you know. The, uh, um, but he said, no, it's just normal. Didn't look at it, didn't do anything. So the third week, or the second, second post-op week, I went in and I said, you, you've got to send me somewhere else. We got to go to it. I don't want to see a partner. Somebody else has got to see me. And he said, well, since it's been three weeks, we'll order an emergency scan. He called over there to the, you know, the, the Florida imaging. Um, and you know how when you, when you get any kind of imaging done on your body, you never see the doctor ever, you know, because they're just going to read the stuff and send a report in. You just see the tech. The tech was, was scanning my tech, my testicle area, um, trying to be as, less graphic as I can be, um, for about 60 seconds and then ran out of the room. About 60 more seconds went by and Dr. Pansky, who I've never met because he just reads the stuff, you don't meet him, ran in the room and he looked at the screen and he said, um, we're trying to organize a helicopter to get here. Wow. Or an ambulance because you have, he said in, in medicine, and I know you know this Chad because you've had so much stuff done, we have, a, we have what's called called stat uh, and stat critical and you're stat critical and I said what do you mean he said you have zero blood flow uh, going beyond that region of your body so um, it's Orlando traffic and I know Orlando well and I had a Dodge Challenger and I don't mind getting a speeding ticket so I said I'd already been in pain three weeks I said uh, uh, can I just drive to the ER and he said, if you'll, if you'll leave now, but you have to go directly there. So I haul ass over there in, uh, in this, you know, very fast car. Uh, and when I get there, oddly enough, the surgeons are there that did my hernia surgery, waiting for me in the ER when I pull up. And we go right to the back. And the entire attitude has changed. I mean, they're just kissing, you know, ass like, nobody's business. I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but that's just what they were doing. Um, and the urologist looked at me and he said, it's, it, I can't save it. It's got to come out. I may be able to save the other one. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I, I know well enough to know that they can't operate on me for, uh, that I have to be checked in the hospital for 24 to 48 hours before they can operate on me because they have to put basically frozen plasma in me to thicken my blood or I'll bleed out on the table because I'm on so much blood thinning. So I woke up without, without a testicle. Now, <laughs> he luckily could save one. What I learned from that experience is uh, that I'd never thought about is the most critical thing in a, um, an above knee amputee life. And I mean, the most critical thing in having an active, and I'm a very active amputee. We're talking riding horses, climbing mountains, swimming with sharks. I, you know, um, the most important facet of being able to maintain that level of activity is maintaining your weight, because the socket is what holds it onto your body. And unless you can buy a socket every time you gain two pounds or lose five pounds at thirty thousand dollars a pop. It's not going to fit right. It's going to rub. It's going to be too tight and squeeze you and cut off circulation, or it's going to be too loose and it's going to fall off. 
Well, testosterone is one of the major factors that contributes to managing your weight internally. That's why when you take, you know, steroids, you get bigger, you know, um, you can pump it up, you know, kind of thing. Um, so uh, I've pretty much been unable to use my leg. Um, uh, and I, I didn't even allow wheelchairs in this house when we bought it. Um, because I swore if I ever got out of one, I would never go back in one. You know, that, that, that's how serious I took it. Um, big, huge airports like Singapore's, I wouldn't allow Dan to push me. And in in you know, I said, no, I'm not getting back in that thing. It might hurt by the time I get 15 miles, you know, to the other side of this thing. But um, but any rate, um, I, uh, uh, I, in uh, October of this year, I got, I couldn't take it anymore. I realized that I just not only started over, but I just went 10 years in the past. There's nothing I could do. There's, you know, and I took 40 Xanax and drove my Challenger as fast as I could into a brick wall on purpose. Um, and that was just in this year, you know, that was this past October. I, I, I wrote five suicide notes, you know, to Dan and to, you know, uh, you know, to various people. And remarkably, I wasn't even remotely injured. Uh, they don't know how the Xanax didn't kill me. Uh, maybe the speed of which someone called or that I got there. I don't remember any of it. Um, but I, I, you know, so but I'm sorry about your friend. And it, it, I, I take it very personally because that's, that's nothing I ever, I mean, you know, I, I went through, you know, literally eight, eight bypasses where they rip you from your ankles to your chest, eight of those. And then five where they rip you pretty much all the way across back to back for five years. Then I had this shoulder replaced. Then I had my right leg replaced. It's all titanium. Um, and none of that broke me. I've never cried. I never whined about it. I never, it's just, let's just get it done. I picked the day for them to remove my leg. I said, just chop the damn thing off. Let's go. Let's get, get busy, you know, living or get busy dying. And that broke me. And I'm still really, really struggling with how to overcome it. I think that when I hear you talk about that broke me, those are words that I have sometimes just come to, I think for myself, uh, my words would be, I, I can't do this anymore. You know, yeah. I, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And it's been, I think, important for me to recognize that there's no judgment in that. I'm not going to judge my friend who's gone now. That's not helpful for me. Sure. It's not going to be helpful for her or for her husband or for her family. It is important for me to try to understand it. For her is important, you know, for me to understand what my friend went through. It's important for me to listen to what you're saying, right? Not so I can take notes. I recently realized that this past week, while she had been airlifted after the suicide attempt, had survived the suicide attempt, had then gone into a coma, had a stroke, been taken off life support, and then died. Through all that, I recognized that there was a grief, there was a sadness, there was a sense of confusion, I think, that I would have naturally felt and gone through. I also have to admit there was another piece of me that was, and I hate to say this this way, but taking notes, right? Making an awareness list of, okay, well, this is how she did that. I wonder what would happen if I did that. This is how I'm reacting to her being gone. I'm going to get over this. Maybe my family would get over this. In other words, people who commit suicide or think about commits committing suicide and these are very hard conversations you and i are having sure so i want to really be specific to anyone that's listening that if this is triggering in any way you may want to take a break right. and if you need to come back to this at another time that'd be fine but if you're having any suicidal thoughts or any kind of reaction to this please reach out for help and call the suicide hotline which will be down below in the description please take time to take care of yourself here these are tough topics What's been important me, to me to recognize is that when I have those moments of it broke me, when I have these moments of I'm done and I have gotten to the point where I have attempted suicide when I was younger, there are pieces of me 
that will never be the same is the way I put it. So it's interesting when I talk to someone like you has had so many physical manifestations of I will never be the same. And yet with all the titanium, with the meds, with the healing that you've gone through and with the no excuses, you're here today. There's a part of you that somehow is not ever the same as it was, as you were before any of these things happened. And you're definitely not the same as you were before October, are you? You've no. changed. The, 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 the second that I was cognizant and woke up and was explained what I did, um, and I mean the second, I felt like the biggest idiot in the world because, you know, in the grand scheme of things, I live a great life. I mean, you know, I do. Uh, you know, there are people that live better lives, but there are a lot of people that live a, a whole lot worse. Um, so it, life is what you make it. And I've, uh, you know, I just, I, I felt like a quitter on myself because I've been fighting for all these years, you know, and, um, you know, I, I've, 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 I've had a lot of, and it, it, get, get, it gets into some touchy things, but it's, there's a lot of disabled people's, um, they don't like to be told they're an inspiration or they're, you know, um, and that's never bothered me. If someone sees me, you know, jump into a cage with great whites and that inspires them to do it, I'm, I'm risking less. I've already lost one leg. All he's going to do is take, you know, the second one. Um, you know, so there's less risk to me, but it's a, But uh, it, it was a, it was stupid. It was something that I was ashamed of. But it was something that, uh, as soon as I came home, um, I I thought that it was important enough to tweet out, and I'm in like a, you know, a five long section tweet. A lot of y'all don't know what's been going on, but here's what's been going on, and here's what I did. I immediately regretted it. Never make this choice or other choices, you know, that kind of thing. Most people wouldn't tweet out that kind of stuff, but I, you know, um, I, I thought it was important. Um, Chad, Chad, what's the difference between shame and guilt for you? Because the word shame is, I feel, I mean, the word guilt is, is, is if for me, is equivalent to I feel, I feel bad about what I've done. The word shame is I feel bad about what I am or who I am. And I'm just uh, curious because you use the word shame. I guess sh shame to me is when I feel I've let other people down. Uh, whereas guilt to me is where I l I've let myself down. Fair enough. Um, you know, uh, and it, you know, for, you know, it obviously wasn't my night. God was on my shoulder that night because, you know, if you can't drive a 360 horsepower Dodge Charger into a soft, solid brick wall and not have a scratch on you. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it's just not possible. Some would say, and this would be unfair, I wouldn't, I shouldn't start a sentence by saying some would say, I could hear someone saying, and I could hear myself maybe in another manifestation of an earlier me saying, you're just, you're just trying to get attention. You're <laughs> jumping in a shark tank just cause you want attention. You're just driving that challenger because yeah, I can see the smile on your face, right? You just want attention. Now I'm going to flip that around for a minute because my friend who just died, uh, she committed suicide and uh, the way she did it was by using, uh, by cutting. And the, the manifestation of some of these acts of suicidal uh, attempts are known to be psychologically from a mental health perspective cries for help absolute oh, yeah. cries for help what's the difference between someone who jumps in a shark tank and someone who drives their car into a brick wall well the shark tank's a controlled environment <laughs> somewhat <laughs> and and it dry well that wasn't free either neither are free they're both rather costly but um um, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I, I've just always been the adventurous guy. I love jumping out of airplanes. I just love doing those types of things. And, 
um, uh, after I'd finally beaten all this and, uh, um, you know, felt uh, really, really comfortable with my leg, um, I, 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 you know, told Dan, I said, look, you know, we've owned several businesses. We've been moderately successful. You know, we're not, you know, wealthy by any means, but we, you know, and, you know, we've been out of the country like once in 15 years. I said, I want to go see the world. And um, so we put up our, put up the company and sold it. And uh, uh, literally just nonstop travel, 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 travel. And um, primarily to try to find things that, um, that kind of the Anthony Bourdain side of things. But, Find the stuff that the tourists don't do, and you know, and you'll have fun. And, and a lot of it's been fun, and a lot of it's been miserable as hell. I mean, we I rode a camel for so long through the Wadi Rum Desert to camp out with the Bedouins who fed me goat, uh, but all I saw was white eyeballs. Um, but you know, how many people can say they did that? You know, and, and, and Dan's camel hated him, so they put him on a little donkey. The best picture I have is a picture of me on a big camel and him on a little, I mean, I mean a mini donkey. His feet were dragging in the Wadi Rum sand. It was so, but uh, so now we've got, we, we actually have a travel rule where I pick where we're going anywhere in the we and we've gotten to the point of throwing darts at maps. Here's where we're going and, and then the next trip he'll pick. And we'll, I mean, you know, it's a, we were in Bratislava, Slovakia for New Year's. Who the hell picks Bratislava Slovakia for New Year's? I mean, but that's where we were, and we had a great time, and it was, you know, uh, <laughs> and they really love you there because they don't get a lot of tourists. So it's like, okay. When you talk about being an inspiration, and I understand, I have a friend who's uh, trans, and when that was happening there was an announcement made because we worked together and i remember stopping by her desk and saying you know thank you for what you've done because that was really an inspiration and my friend just looked at me and says well i'm not doing this because i want to be an inspiration i'm doing this because i got to be me this is me and i said yeah I, I i get that i said yeah but there's a lot of people who couldn't do what you're doing and even to do something so small compared to what you're doing will take in a great deal of courage. Don't take, please don't take your inspiration to them away from them. So right, um, right. No, right, I, 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 it's okay that you're not doing it to be an inspiration, but don't tell me that I can't be inspired by you because I may need that inspiration. No, and and I, 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 I wholeheartedly just disagree with the disabled community on that. I just, I just do because there are disabled people that have inspired the hell out of me as I became disabled, uh, usually children, you know, when I'm sitting there fighting this leg, walking between, you know, ballet bars and griping and, oh, I can, oh, it hurts, I can't walk. You know, and a six-year-old walks in that just lost both their legs to a lawnmower accident and they throw their legs on and 15 minutes later, they're running around kicking a soccer ball. And that's literally how they do it. Pretty but hard to it, feel sorry for yourself at yeah, that point. It's like, shut up, Chad. I mean, that six-year-old is an inspiration. They, you know, they don't even give them physical training or PT, physical therapy, because it slows them down. They just give them the legs and let the kid figure it out. And I mean, they are zipping and zapping. I mean, it is a, it's an inspiration. Uh, I find a lot of people uh, very inspiring. It's just, you know, somebody's got to gripe about everything, I think. Well, that's that's why I asked you if you would meet with me today, and I'm really grateful you did. The tweets that you put out are you. Uh, I don't like, I, I don't always, I can't say I don't like, but I have a different take on the word that's used a lot these days, which is authentic or authenticity, because I, I think you can be inauthentically authentic and authentically inauthentic. Bottom right. line is, even when I'm inauthentic, I'm still authentically inauthentic. I'm still me, <laughs> right? I'm still right. me. Yeah. But what you're putting out there is wherever you are, you know, in, in the last five minutes or in this second. Right. And what I really appreciate, and, and I'll ask you this, because I think that 
Interesting. There's a lot of people that are looking for happiness. I'm looking for happiness. I want to be, you know, physically happy. You know, I'm physically broken in many ways. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I've gone through a lot of physical trauma. I've been molested. I've been raped. I've had a lot of things physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually happen to me. So have you and so have many. And I recognize that there's this, uh, there's this class that Yale put out back in 2018. Just read about it today, so I've been thinking about it. And it's called the happiness class. That's the, you know, kind of shorthand for it. And it was only taken, only done once in person with a huge, huge class. Yeah. And since then it's been done remotely. You can go on Coursera and get the class. I think I'll try to find a link and put it below in the description. But during the pandemic, it's like 3.3 million people oh, have yeah. jumped on this class. I guess because we have time, but also there's this need for this understanding of mental health happiness. Sure. And because we can have physical happiness. And like you said, these kids, they don't have, you know, this, this young kid doesn't have two legs, but you strap on the, 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 the legs that they have and they, they physically, you know, try to find happiness in their life. The understanding that they came up with in this course is, you know, they, they say, you know, you need to sleep well, right? They also say that you need to be grateful. And the third thing that I found really important is they say, you need to help others. If you want to be happy, you got to do this not for you, but do it for others. Care for other people, reach out for other people. So as much as I recognize what you're saying, which is maybe that little kid isn't trying to be an inspiration, right? Oh, and maybe absolutely. you're not, maybe you're not jumping in a shark tank to be an inspiration. But the idea that you're posting it on Twitter, the, the idea that you went through a tragedy, a trauma, some kind of a suicidal attempt, and you're, you're sharing it with other people, that's just not to get it off your chest. Am I right? No, it's not like I said, like, I, I really treat uh, um, Twitter like uh, like my personal diary, because, um, uh, you know, I don't have the best memory. I don't know if it's, I don't know, but, but it's slowly getting worse. Um, and I can go back and go, you know, uh, like the other day, I was just curious. And I'm like, what, what was I tweeting about um, on the 1st of March last year? Was it all COVID, 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 COVID? And, uh, and it wasn't, no, I, we weren't even mentioning it, you know, uh, we were kind of halfway mentioning it, but I was talking about, I had to go in for a, you know, a hernia surgery and all this other you know, stuff. I just like to be able to scroll back and, and it, it it's like a little rewind in my brain. Um, um, I mean, I can see an argument that me and granny Gail had, you know, a year and a half ago. And I'll, I'll immediately remember what started, not the argument, but you know, what started the, uh, the bickering and, you know, that that bickering between you and granny is going to be a a classic if you can save every one of those tweets and download them they, oh. we could write an entire netflix series just based oh. on those tweets i swear to goodness she is a yeah there and i i met her through her daughter actually oh interesting i didn't through, know that through jill the jill's a police officer got it got it yeah. You are also, and I hope you don't mind me telling the public here, you also are thinking about writing your own uh, memoir and you've gotten a few <laughs> chapters penned. You want to tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> it's a, uh, well, I, I, I've, I've debated it since I saw how thick yours was. I thought they could be thinner, um, but no, it's just, it's called No Excuses. And it's, uh, because I do get asked a lot, man, how to, somewhat sarcastically i think but occasionally genuinely you know how do you keep going on I, i'd never do that I, I was just told in uh, this december i was told uh, by a, a guy i was riding a, a horse uh, and i was told uh, literally he just, he just walked up to me on the horse and said uh, if they took my leg off i'd just i'd kill myself i'm like well thank you i don't know you sir but you know not, you know so it's a, uh, so i you know i'm like well that's living your life with an excuse. And I, I don't do that. So it's called no well, the excuse. work that, uh, and I will say to the public, I won't read it out loud, but the piece that you sent me is the first chapter, I believe. 
Yeah. Was the first chapter. And of course, just to let you know, I remember my first chapter before it was edited <laughs> and yeah. it could all change. But the oh, miracle yeah. of what I think you're sent, you sent to me is that you are your first sentence and I won't read it out loud. You can read it if you wanted to, but the first sentence is just you. It's you speaking in a voice that I can understand. The understanding that I have is like when you're reading my book, you know now, cause you've met, this is the first time we've ever met. Right. And you know now that what you're reading in the book is the real deal. Cause this is the same guy that you've been reading about. It's the voice of a person that as soon as you read the first page, you're like, I don't know what this book is about, but I feel like I know this person already. And right. I hope that that's what you got in reading Dear Stephen Michael's Mother, because that's what I got in the first chapter of your book. Now, I realize that it needs to be edited. And just to go real quick, my first draft ended up being 139,000 words. So you think <laughs> this, you think what you're reading is thick? I brought it down after editing and editing and editing to 101. And I got a professional editor, Ginny Ruths from Touchstone Publishing, who brought it from 101 down to the 85K or so that you see right. now. And then there was a bunch of proofreading after that. It takes time to get it honed in, but I'm gonna tell you, the beautiful thing about writing a thin book is, most of the thin books were 14 books within that. And Stephen King has a way of saying it. He says, you write everything, write everything in there. And then you edit later. Sure. And he calls it killing your children. Because <laughs> of course you're putting, <laughs> you're putting your your heart into this. You're writing things that matter to you. And I can't tell you how many things I had to, you know, slice and dice and chop because it didn't move the story along. And that was important to know. But don't stop writing what you're writing. You're on to something there. Again, the first sentence. Go back and read it if you don't know what I'm talking about. That first sentence is the exact guy that I've talked to today. I'm it's the to same. Think. It's I'm trying the to think same. what it what it what it was. Um, I don't see. I knew you wouldn't. I, that's why I'm going to make you go back. And a first sentence needs to pop off the page and yours does. But also the whole first chapter, as 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 you know, as unedited and raw as it is in many ways, it's well written. And I think that as a author, I'm hoping that you will continue to write and send me more. I also hope that the public will follow you on Twitter and get to know you more. Tell us about the podcast that you're working on. Um, it, it, it's called Undeniably Us, all right? <laughs> and it's basically, it'll be me, um, me, Gigi, uh, Ernie, who you know well, um, um, Morgan Fairchild is, you know, gangbusters for it. Um, uh, in fact, I guess her quote was, uh, it would be a blast. So, um, um, our only side is uh, because none of us are located in the same location. It's a little more difficult fundamentally to put a what uh, to, to put a podcast where multiple people are talking without being able to you know shut people off and all that um, than than I ever dreamed it would be. Um, so I've had my techie nerd friends over for the last week trying to uh, uh, that's all what what I call them my. The, that that's a compliment they'll take that as a compliment oh they'll love it yeah yeah but um, um organizing all these boards that i don't know how to use and all this stuff that you know um, but we're, we're we're excited we basically just want to do it for fun i mean G Gigi's only rule was you know and uh, i respect it is um very few people want to use their real name you know um, particularly you know um just, just granny gale you know um, um, and her other rule was, I'm going to cuss, you know, and, you know, I, I talk like a sailor. It's been a lot of work for me not to, you know, blow your glasses off, you know, just sitting here having a normal conversation. Um, I, I, and I don't know when I started doing it, but it's, it's gradually just, you know, uh, but maybe because I don't have children. So the only, you know, upbringing I'm hurting are my, my dogs, you know, you know. They're, they're, you know, their their poor virgin ears will never be the same. Um, Gary, Gary V has a way of saying it. They'll, I don't know if you know who Gary Vanderchuk is, but uh, he'll say, you know, people will ask him, why do you say fuck all the time? And he says, because that's how I talk. Yeah, that's and 
and I'm not trying to do it to shock anyone. As a matter of fact, what I think most of your friends, if they're listening to this now, will be shocked that they haven't heard you swear for the last half an hour. <laughs> well, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We've, been talking, we've been talking for the last half an hour or so with Chad Anderson. I'm reading off his Twitter profile. He's a retired CEO, Gator guy, above the knee amputee, 50 plus countries, hashtag travel junkie, husband of Dan, 20 years, dad of the late great junior. Bacon, cheeseburger, and small fry. And please do me a favor, if you would, let folks know who are listening or watching this, how they can get in touch with you. Um, uh, just follow me on Twitter. It's at one leg Chad. At one leg Chad, and that's at the number one, one. L E G C H A D. Again, I'm looking at the Twitter handle now. That's the great way to, to keep in touch with the chat. And I will be the first to attest that if you reach out to Chad, it'll be about 14 seconds before he reaches back out to you and you, <laughs> you will not regret it. Thanks so much, Chad, for spending the time today. And if everyone who's listening today or watching, uh, we're really grateful that you were here today. I'm sure Chad and I will chat again in the future. Uh, please make sure you like this video, subscribe, and Chad will probably definitely be checking down below. So if you want to leave some comments down below in the discussion area, go ahead and do that. I would love it. And I know Chad would take some time to respond there too. reach out to Chad. I'll put all the links below for his Twitter handle in the description. And I hope to see you all again soon. Thanks so much, Chad, for taking the time. Thanks, man. Go buy his book. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a nice ending. I love that.